In the late 1800s, American railroads faced a brutal choice. Spend a fortune on fuel or risk everything. The fix was simple and savage. They ordered 3,000 locomotives with a cab perched on top of a raging boiler where the engineer straddled massive steel rods. If a pin failed, a rod could snap and become a metal whip, turning the cab into a death zone. Profits soared. The casualty lists did too. If the Camelback was a solution, why did it keep killing the people who drove it? The real story starts with the fuel that made this death trap possible. The anthracite fields of Pennsylvania were a gold mine for anyone who could figure out how to burn the waste. By the 1870s, mountains of calm, broken rock, coal dust and rejects piled up beside the breakers. To the mine owners, it was trash. To the railroads, it was the cheapest fuel in America. Calm cost next to nothing. The only thing standing between a railroad and a fortune was the challenge of getting any heat from it. Bituminous coal, the standard, burned hot and fast but came with a price tag that could eat up a railroad's profits. Anthracite Culm, on the other hand, was so cheap it was almost free, if you could make it work. Railroad accountants watched the ledgers. Every ton of bituminous coal purchased was money out the door. Every ton of column burned was money saved. For the Philadelphia and Reading, Central Railroad of New Jersey and the Lackawanna, the difference was survival. In the cutthroat world of the late 19th century, fuel cost was the line between bankruptcy and expansion. Maps of the region told the story. Nearly every major coal-hauling railroad had a direct line into the anthracite fields, and every corporate boardroom was looking for ways to squeeze more out of the waste piles. By 1877, John Wooten had proven that with the right firebox, Colm could power a locomotive. The financial math was irresistible. Hundreds of engines burning nearly free fuel meant millions in savings over a decade. That is why the decision to gamble with crew safety was never really a mystery. The motive was written in every balance sheet. When the price of fuel drops to almost zero, the cost of risk starts to look like just another line item. The Camelback was born from this calculation, not as an accident, but as a deliberate answer to the question, how much is a man's life worth compared to a mountain of free coal? John Wooten wasn't chasing glory or headlines, he was staring at a mountain of worthless rock and figuring out how to turn it into money. In 1877, he filed a patent for a firebox unlike anything seen before on American rails. Instead of squeezing the firebox between the wheels, Wooten's design stretched it out, wide and flat, perched above the driving wheels like a rooftop. The grate alone covered more square feet than a New York City studio apartment. It was a furnace big enough to swallow shovelfuls of calm and actually get heat out of them. The blueprints from that year look almost cartoonish next to the engines that came before. The firebox juts out on both sides, giving the locomotive a swollen, hunchbacked silhouette. But that was the whole point. Anthracite waste would not burn in a narrow box. It needed space to spread out, a wide bed where air could flow up through the coal and coax out every last bit of heat. The result was a combustion chamber that dwarfed anything running on bituminous coal. It could burn the waste piles clean, and it did it almost smokelessly, a selling point for railroads choking on their own exhaust in crowded cities. The numbers made railroad accountants sit up straight. With Wooten's firebox, an engine could run on fuel that cost a fraction of the usual price. Multiply that by a fleet, and the savings ran into the millions over a decade. The design was so effective that other railroads scrambled to copy it, and soon the wide firebox became the must-have feature for anyone hauling coal out of Pennsylvania. But Wooten's breakthrough came with a catch. The firebox was now so wide and so tall, there was nowhere left to put the engineer's cab in the usual spot behind it. The very thing that made the design profitable, its sheer size, created a new problem that would haunt every crew who climbed aboard. The solution, as it turned out, would be even more radical than the firebox itself. The engineer's world was a wooden box, bolted like an afterthought to the top of a rolling steel furnace. There was no shelter behind the firebox anymore, no buffer of steel or coal, just a thin floor over the hottest part of the locomotive. Summer turned the cab into a kiln. Thermometers nailed to the wall sometimes read 120 degrees, but the real measure was the sweat that soaked through uniforms before the train even left the yard. 
Heat radiated up from the boiler, seeping through boots, prickling skin, and baking lungs with every breath. The engineer's seat straddled the boiler's crown, inches above boiling water and roaring fire. Every steel lever, every gauge, seemed to shimmer with heat. There was no relief. Open a window, and the draft only pulled in more cinders and scalding air. The cab was perched halfway between the firebox and the smokestack, suspended over the driving wheels. The engineer sat so high that his knees nearly brushed the glass, his boots planted on a floor that vibrated with the pulse of the rods below. The space was barely wide enough for a man to turn around. In winter, the wind sliced through the cab seams, freezing fingers that had just been roasted minutes before. In summer, the wooden walls trapped every degree of heat, turning the air thick and suffocating. There was nowhere to hide from the temperature swings, no insulation, no fan, just the relentless push of heat and cold. Every run was a test of endurance. Hands blistered from grabbing hot metal, eyes stung from sweat and coal dust. The engineer was always aware of what lay beneath, the spinning mass of rods and wheels, the pressure building inside the boiler, the knowledge that a single failure could end everything in an instant. The cab's design didn't just ignore comfort, it erased it. The only thing separating the engineer from the boiling chaos below was a few planks of wood and the hope that nothing would go wrong before the next station. Under the camelback's wooden floor, steel rods spun faster than the eye could follow. They weren't harmless parts, they were the muscle of the locomotive, transmitting the full force of the pistons to the drive wheels. Each rod was anchored by a steel pin, hammered in place and expected to hold against thousands of pounds of pressure, mile after mile. But steel fatigues and pins wear. When one failed, the result was not a gentle breakdown. It was sudden, violent, and almost always fatal for anyone above. A snapped side rod did not just fall off, it turned into a weapon, swinging with the speed of a threshing machine and the weight of a sledgehammer. The rod, now free, whipped around with the momentum of an entire moving train behind it. The floorboards above offered as much protection as a sheet of paper. In seconds, the rod could tear through wood, iron, and flesh, anything in its path. Engineers called it the scythe, the metal whip, the death stroke. There are records of rods punching straight through the cab, splintering the engineer's seat, leaving nothing but twisted wreckage in the spot where a man had been sitting seconds before. The geometry of the camelback made this more than a remote risk. The engineer's legs straddled the exact zone where the rods spun. There was no escape hatch, no safe corner, just the hope that every pin held fast. Metallurgists of the era understood the danger. Stress loads on those rods were enormous, especially at speed. A single flaw in the steel, a crack invisible to the naked eye, could spell disaster. The railroad companies knew the numbers and they weighed the odds. But the calculation always favored profit. A few more tons of cheap coal moved, a few less dollars spent on repairs or redesign. For the men in the cab, it was a lottery with the worst kind of ticket. Every run meant trusting their lives to a handful of steel pins and hoping that today would not be the day the rods decided to break loose. The Camelback's kill zone was not an accident. It was engineered into every mile. The fireman's world was 20 feet behind the engineer, out in the open, standing on a metal deck that shook with every mile. On a winter night, the temperature could drop below zero. The wind howled across the tender, blasting him with snow and sleet. There was no cab, no shelter, just a thin rail to grip and the blinding white glare of the firebox door. Every few minutes, he would shovel another load of coal into the furnace, sweat freezing on his back while his face burned from the radiant heat. The only light came from the fire itself, flaring up and dying down, throwing shadows across the deck. This was pure isolation. Communication with the engineer was a fantasy. Between them, the boiler stretched like a steel wall, hissing and rumbling, drowning out any shout. The rods hammered beneath the engineer's feet, a constant metallic roar. If the fireman slipped, if he lost his footing on the icy deck and fell, the train would thunder on for miles before anyone noticed. There was no way to warn the engineer about low water or a problem with the fire. He learned about a missed signal or a sudden stop the hard way when the tender lurched and nearly pitched him into the night. This was enforced silence. Oral histories from men who worked these engines paint a picture of isolation and fear. 
One fireman recalled sparks landing on his coat, burning through wool and skin while the wind froze his hands to the shovel. Another remembered the silence, the kind that fills your head when you realize you are alone, cut off, and the only thing keeping you alive is your grip and your balance. The rods kept pounding, the snow kept falling. The engineer, locked in his own wooden box, could not see the fireman, could not hear him, could not help. On a camelback, every man was on his own. The only thing that traveled faster than the train was the fear that something would go wrong before the next stop. A camelback's danger wasn't theoretical. The record is littered with moments when the machine lived up to its nickname. In the winter of 1911, engineer Thomas Kearney was running a Reading Company camelback out of Port Clinton. The boiler's crown sheet, the thin plate separating fire from steam, lost its water. Within seconds, superheated steam blasted through the cab floor. Kearney never stood a chance. His body was found slumped over the controls, scalded beyond recognition. The ICC report was blunt. Crew position contributed directly to fatality. On the Erie Railroad in 1922, a 10-wheeler hit a split rail at speed. The locomotive left the tracks. The cab sheared off as the boiler rolled. The engineer was pinned inside his wooden box atop the boiler. He was crushed before he could reach the window. The fireman, working alone at the rear, was thrown clear and survived with broken ribs. The report listed the engineer as killed instantly, no means of escape. Falls from the tender were a quieter kind of death. In 1908, the ICC investigated the case of an unnamed fireman who vanished during a night run on the Central Railroad of New Jersey. The train thundered on for miles before anyone noticed. Only a battered shovel and a patch of blood on the ballast told the story. No witness, no warning. Silence was part of the design. These were not isolated events. The ICC files stack up. Scalded engineers, mangled bodies, firemen lost to darkness and cold. Each case is a line in a ledger, a tally of risk paid in flesh. The pattern was undeniable. The Camelback killed not by accident, but by design. As the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers gathered these reports, the case against the Widowmaker grew louder, forcing the industry to answer for every name buried in the fine print. By the early 1900s, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers had seen enough. They started compiling lists, names, dates, details, every injury, every death, every man lost to the Camelback. The numbers were damning. Union newspapers ran columns headlined with casualty counts, hammering home what the railroads tried to bury in fine print. The term Widowmaker began to appear in testimony and flyers, picked up by grieving families and echoed in union halls. This was not just shop talk, it was a rallying cry. The Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers archives filled with affidavits, engineers describing rods slicing through cab floors, firemen recounting nights spent frozen and alone, widows testifying about husbands who never came home. The union's data campaign was not just about statistics, it was about forcing the public and the government to confront the cost of cheap coal. They flooded the Interstate Commerce Commission with petitions demanding hearings, waving casualty sheets in the faces of reporters and politicians. The evidence was overwhelming. Every accident, every lost limb, every funeral was another page in the case file against the Camelback. The railroads could deny, deflect, or stall, but the numbers kept climbing. The pressure was building, and the Interstate Commerce Commission could no longer look away. In the hearing rooms of the Interstate Commerce Commission, the evidence was impossible to ignore. Reports stacked high on the table. Lists of injuries, affidavits from widows, diagrams showing the cab's fatal alignment over the rods. After years of union pressure and public outcry, the Commission issued its ruling. No new center cab locomotives would be built or approved for service on American rails. The language was cold and clinical, focused on design, not on death, but the meaning was clear. The Camelback's days were numbered. Yet in a final compromise, the commission allowed every existing Camelback to keep running until it wore out. No forced retirements, no recall. Thousands of engines, some already decades old, were grandfathered in. For the crews, nothing changed overnight. The same machines rolled out of the yards, carrying the same risks, protected by a legal technicality. The verdict had been read, 
but the sentence would take years to carry out. Safety, once again, was balanced against the bottom line. The Camelback wasn't just an engineering gamble, it exposed how easily profit can eclipse human life. Today, safety regulations exist because disasters force change, not because risk vanished. As automation and new technologies roll out, the lesson remains urgent. Every shortcut has a cost, and it is paid by people first. We inherit the rails they laid. Let's not repeat their mistakes. What's your take? Share your thoughts below.